Okay. Welcome, and we're going to study Romans. I taught Romans eight years ago. I thought it was like six or seven, but uh, John asked me, and I checked it yesterday, and I taught it eight years ago, but for some time I've wanted to teach it again. Now, I know that Wayne led a year-long study of the book of Romans that ended a year or so ago. I'm not exactly sure, but it, maybe a year ago. And so he, he did that study, and in fact, I've been teasing Wayne, saying I needed to get a license from him if I wanted to teach Romans again. Now, he's got the nerve not to be in here. I'm going to do... <laughs> But I know, that, I know that he taught it, but if you were in Wayne's class, I'm hoping that I can supplement and reinforce what you learned there and, and maybe bring a different perspective on some things, but you can be sure that Wayne and I combined will not exhaust the riches of the book of Romans, okay? So you can, you can be sure of that. So there's going to be, uh, there's, there's plenty to go around in the study, now, you'll not be surprised to learn that this morning we're going to spend a fair amount of time on introductory matters. I always do that, and I do that because uh, these letters that we study, they're, they're, they're occasional documents. They're written to specific groups of people in history, and the way God speaks to us through them is we first need to understand what was the Spirit of God saying through Paul, to the Romans, and then when we hear that correctly, we're then in a position to understand what is God saying to us today through what he said to the Romans. And so we have this, so understanding something of the setting and the situation and the context can be of benefit as we try to understand what Paul is saying, because we're really, in some sense, we're hearing like one side of a conversation because there's a relationship and we hear one side of it and we're trying to understand what is he saying and so I like to spend some time on the introduction to situate the letter as best we can because I think that that may wind up helping us uh, in understanding what Paul is saying. Now I'm going to do my best as I always do when I'm teaching to explain Paul's train of thought. And I think that's just crucial because you can parachute into the Bible and make it say anything. And so you really have to work to follow the train of thought so you can understand correctly. That's the context. That's the literary context, the thought. And so I want to try to paint for you and follow and track Paul's train of thought. Now, there are, of course, difficult things in the letter. I mean, there are things regarding which reasonable people disagree but you've been in my class before, you know that what I do is I offer to you my understanding for you to weigh. Okay, so I, I work at it, I give you the best I have in studying these things, I present them to you, and then you need to weigh them and see if you think that's the truth and that resonates and I think that's right, that's the voice of God. And so uh, that's all I can do. And so that's what, I, that's what I try to do. Now, the translation that I'll be using throughout, it tends to be woodenly literal, but I like that for study purposes because it, it makes it easier for you to see when I'm saying this is how I understand this. If I can show you that, it just skips some steps. I don't have to go from this one and then say, yes, but this is a word you can understand this way. Now, I will, I will uh, throughout the study, I will comment on various translation choices where it's appropriate, where I think this might strike somebody as odd, and then I'll explain what's behind that. Now, it may be helpful for you to go to this website, which is my website, and there I have an outline of the Book of Romans. I've posted it there rather than printing them up, and you know, I never know how many people are going to be here, who wants one, who cares. So you can go to, the out, to the, that website and there's an outline of the book of Romans there, and that'll give you a good idea of how I understand the flow of the book. It's basically taken from Douglas Moo's uh, outline. So you can go there and look, and I just, to me, those kinds of things are important because it shows you kind of how I see the movement through the book, and that's basically tracking the thought of it. Okay, let's, uh, let's do some introduction. Romans has played a profound role in church history. The book was instrumental in the conversion of Augustine, 
who was a very influential theologian of the late 4th and early 5th centuries. Romans played a major role in the Protestant Reformation, of which we are all heirs, played a major role in that. Frederick Godet, who was a New Testament scholar from the 19th century, he wrote in his commentary on Romans, he said, quote, the Reformation was undoubtedly the work of the epistle to the Romans. So it played a very important and pivotal role in church history. Indeed, it played a pivotal role in the life of Martin Luther, a Catholic priest who was one of the leading voices in the Protestant Reformation. It was with regard to reading Romans that, that, and the insight that he received while studying Romans that Luther wrote, quote, I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. Romans, likewise, it had a profound effect on the English reformer, William Tyndale. It had a profound effect on John Calvin, the French reformer who led the Reformation in Geneva. And modern scholars are just effusive in their praise of the book of Romans. They call it the cathedral of the Christian faith and describe it as one of the, quote, most important pieces of literature in the intellectual history of Western man. To study Romans is to study one of the deepest and richest revelations of God. And if we're not blessed in the study, the fault lies with you, with me, or with both of us. It certainly doesn't lie with the book of Romans. So we're going to work on it and just see what God has in store for us as we journey through the book. Now, Romans was, of course, written by the Apostle Paul, written by Paul through the hand of Tertius. And you see that in 1622. Tertius is Paul's secretary, is what we'd call it. He's a scribe, somebody who's skilled in writing. Uh, a technical term for it is an amanuensis. But basically, he's a secretary. He's somebody who's actually doing the writing. Now, we know nothing else about Tertius, as this is the only time his name is reported in the New Testament. And ancient authors would give their secretaries or their scribes different levels of responsibility in composing their works. And that's just the way secretaries are used today, right? I mean, sometimes a lawyer might say, hey, write a letter to Joe and tell him I want this. And then she writes the letter and brings it in, he signs it. Or he might just dictate it. You see, and it looks like, so you had that, that same range existed in the ancient world with regard to how much freedom was the scribe given to contribute to the document. And some of that would depend on how much trust you had that the person knew you and how you thought and that kind of thing. But it looks like Paul tends toward here the dictation side. And what leads people to think that is because Romans is very similar to Paul's other writings that as far as we know, Tertius had nothing to do with. So that makes people think, okay, well then, if Tertius wasn't involved in those, he's writing this one and these are very similar to Romans in style and that kind of thing. Well, that suggests that Paul pretty much dictated Romans to Tertius. But clearly, Paul is the author of it. Okay, so even if Tertius contributed to the wording of it, the letter is Paul's. It is Paul's by approval and adoption. So if Tertius, he says here, I want you to say this, 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 and Tertius writes it, Paul gets it and then Paul looks at it and he says, yes, that's what I want to say. You see, so that would be, even if he had more hand in it, and what that would mean is that and I say this because people sometimes say, well, what about inspiration? Well, we have to understand that inspiration is broader than the way we sometimes think of it, right? I mean, Luke goes and investigates, right? He goes and investigates. We say, well, how does that work? Well, obviously, God is orchestrating something very large. You see, well, how does he have the person's, uh, their own style and stuff? Well, obviously, he was at work in that person's life. So when that person came there, he wrote exactly what God wanted written. Well, that's how it works with Tertius. If Tertius had input, well, then the process of inspiration simply encompasses that also. Now, note that Tertius, he includes a personal greeting to the readers. Now, some think that means that Tertius knew some of the people in Rome. It could be, though, that Tertius simply uh, felt a bond with them as fellow Christians. 
You know, I mean, they're family. They're, they're brothers and sisters, so maybe that's what's behind it. Now, it's written, Romans is written as Paul is concluding his third missionary journey. And you can get to that conclusion through a number of uh, pieces of evidence. Paul says in, in chapter 15 of Romans that he's on his way to Jerusalem. So when he's writing Romans, he says he's on his way to Jerusalem at a time when his missionary work in the eastern provinces had been completed. So we know it's late in the game. He's been working and he's been doing that kind of thing. Now he's taking to Jerusalem, he says, the collection from the churches in Macedonia and Achaia for the poor among the saints. He says that in chapter 15, 25 to 27. Now that corresponds to what we see in Acts chapter 24, verse 17, where after completing his missionary journey, Paul says he arrived in Jerusalem with gifts for the poor. So we're situating this here at the, at the end of Paul's third missionary journey. And then he says that after, after delivering the gifts to the saints in Jerusalem, he plans to head to Spain. Now if I go back here, you see here is... I got this little laser guy. See, he's, uh, here's the Peloponnese right here. Now I'm going to back out and just expand that. And here is the Peloponnese we were just looking at. And now I've included all of this part. Paul says that he, what he's planning to do after he delivers the gift, he's going to Spain. So Paul is headed for Spain. He, he plans to go there. He wants to go to Spain. And he's going to visit Rome on the way. So here's Rome. Paul's over here heading to Jerusalem and he wants to go to Spain, but he's going to visit Rome on his way to Spain. And you can see that in 15, 23, and 24, and 28. Now it looks like the letter is written from Corinth. Okay, you see that Paul in chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul commends Phoebe. He says, a servant of the church in Sincrea. And you see that Sincrea is the eastern port of Corinth, right here. So they're very close together. So in fact, Phoebe's probably the one delivering the letter. But he refers to, to Phoebe there. He commends her, a servant of the church in Sincrea. And then in chapter 16, verse 23, he has a greeting from Gaius, in whose house Paul is staying. Okay, well, that fits. We have a reference to Gaius in 1 Corinthians 1.14. So it looks like he's in Corinth, staying with Gaius. And Phoebe, who's a servant of the church in Sincre, is very close. And so he has her come, and she's going to be delivering the letter. And then 16.23, he has a greeting from Erastus, who in the later letter of 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, he's said to have stayed in Corinth. Okay, so this makes sense that Paul is here and he's, he's over in Corinth. Now, one of the interesting things is that Paul describes, in 1623, he describes Erastus as the treasurer of the city. And there is a Latin inscription. It was, I don't remember how many years ago we did a study on the Bible and archaeology. But there is a Latin inscription found in Corinth that refers to Erastus as edile of the city. And that means the commissioner of public works. And that's why the NIV, I didn't check to see if the 2011 version does this, but that's why the NIV takes that term treasurer in 1623 and translates it as commissioner of public works or director of public works. But it may be that the Greek term treasurer that Paul uses in 1623 is broad enough to include edile, that is from the inscription in Corinth, or it could be that he was treasurer when Paul wrote, and then if the term's not broad enough to include that, he then was elevated later to Edile, the commissioner of public works in the city. But I just wanted you to see here that it looks like it's written from Corinth, okay? Because you see these things. He's got Phoebe probably delivering the letter. He's staying in the house of Gaius. You have this. It has a greeting from Erastus in 1621. He has greetings from Timothy and Sosipater, both of whom are included in chapter, Acts chapter 20, verse 4. Both of those guys are included as being with Paul when he left Greece en route to Jerusalem. Okay, so we have them with Paul right at that time, and they're saying, hey, in the letter. 
Okay, now just a sopiter is a shortened form of sosipiter, so their name's a little different, but it's the same guy. So you have that, all of this pointing to the idea that he is there in Greece, and all of it fits with Acts chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. Acts chapter 20, verses 2 and 3 is the time of writing. Paul's concluding his third missionary journey, and he's staying in Greece for three months, which almost certainly means he's in Corinth. He would be in Corinth because that was the capital of the province, and Paul, of course, had deep connections with the church in Corinth. So that's significant because we say, okay, here's when Paul is. He's in, he's in Greece here. Undoubtedly, he's in Corinth at this time. Now, that's significant because Acts 20, verses 2 and 3 can be dated. You see, it's hard to get solid dates for some of these things, but Acts 22 and 3 can be dated fairly closely from Acts 18, 12, which has Paul in Corinth while Gallio was proconsul in Achaia. So we know when Paul's there, okay? So we know that he's there when Gallio's proconsul in Achaia, and there's an inscription from Delphi from which one can calculate that Gallio held the office from the first half of 51 through the first half of 52. Okay, so we have this connection point, we have this thing about Gallio, and then we work forward to Acts chapter 20, verse 2 and 3, estimating how long these things took. And what that leads many people to conclude is that Paul is writing this around A.D. 57. Now, as you can imagine, there's wiggle room. you got some people who would say, no, 58 you got some people who say, no, 56, 55, maybe even some go to 54. In other words, he got there quicker and did these things faster. But 57 is probably the dominant view that Paul is there, he's writing there. Uh, as I say, some would date it a little bit uh, a year earlier uh, or later, and some would date one, two, maybe three years earlier than that. But 57 is a good estimate of when Paul is there and when he's writing it. Now, that date falls within what's known as the five-year period of Nero. Whichever one you take, if you took the 58 all the way down to 54, it falls within what's known as the five-year period of Nero, the first five years of Emperor Nero's reign. Now, Barry Smith, who is a New Testament scholar, he says, this period in Roman history was considered the best period of the Roman Empire since the time of Augustus, unlike the latter part of Nero's reign when the church was persecuted. This may explain why Paul makes no reference to any problems between the Roman believers and the civil authorities. And I thought that was helpful because Paul's writing Romans and you don't see that and here's Nero, but in the early part of Nero's reign, he hadn't turned on the Christians yet. But lest you think that this means that uh, Nero's psychopathic tendencies were not yet evident, oh, they were. <laughs> His gross immorality was on full display. Uh, Andreas Kostenberger and Scott Kellum and Charles Quarles, in their introduction to the New Testament, which is called The Cradle, the Cross, and the Crown, they say this, even early in his reign, however, the emperor was known to practice every kind of obscenity. Suetonius, who's a Roman historian, Suetonius described in vivid detail Nero's sins with mistresses and prostitutes and his unthinkable perversion. Nero raped one of Rome's Vestal Virgins. Vestal Virgins, they were priestesses of the goddess, the Roman goddess Vesta. This guy rapes one of them. Okay, it says that uh, Nero raped one of Rome's Vestal Virgins. He emasculated and then publicly wed a boy named Sporus. Rome joked that the world would have been a happier place if Nero's father had married such a wife. Nero made himself the bride of his freedman, Doriferous. This was Rome's noble leader, and his conduct was undoubtedly a reflection, though perhaps an exaggerated one, of the immoral culture in which he lived. So you see we have this ruler, this leader. So he's not on the Christians yet. But you can see this guy's out there in terms of, in terms of his evil. And that, of course, comes to full flower. Now, the church in Rome, we don't know when or by whom the church in Rome was founded. We just don't know 
how did that come about? Paul had not yet been to Rome. You can see that in chapter 1. You can see it in chapter 15. And Peter is very unlikely as the person who founded the church there because he was still in Jerusalem at the time of Acts chapter 15, and that's about A.D. 49. So he's still there, and there's evidence that the church was already in Rome by that time. So if Peter's still in Jerusalem in A.D. 49, and the church is already in Rome in A.D. 49, it wasn't founded by, by Peter. Now how we know it's already there, it deals with this decree that was issued by Emperor Claudius where he expelled the Jews from Rome over this disruption that was occurring in the Jewish community, disruption that he said at the instigation of Crestus. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But it's, uh, that was in 49 when you had that expulsion. Now, it's also impossible to think that Paul, uh, who in chapter Romans 15, verse 20, he says he wouldn't, uh, that he will not build on another person's foundation. It's impossible to think that he would have written this letter or he would have planned the kind of visit that he describes in chapter 1, verses 8, 8 through 15, to a church that had been founded by Peter. So it's not Paul, it's not Peter. How did the church in Rome get founded? And the most likely scenario is that for the founding there is that you had Jews from Rome who were at Pentecost. They were, at, they were in Jerusalem when Peter preached, and they converted to Christianity, and then they took their Christian faith back to the synagogues in Rome. And that squares with the assessment. There's a 4th century church leader, a fellow named Ambrosiaster, and he said that, uh, that the Romans embraced the faith of Christ without seeing any sign or mighty works of any of the apostles. And so that looks like that's the best solution. How did the church get started there so that it's there by 49? Well, they converted, they went back to their synagogues, and they brought the faith in Christ with them. Now, the church's composition, and this to me is very important in terms of the letter. The church's composition, it's mix between Jew and Gentile. There were both Jewish and Gentile elements in the church in Rome, and it seems likely that the Gentile elements were in a majority that was large enough, and it was predominantly Gentile. They were in a majority that was large enough to justify Paul, including the Christian community in Rome, within the sphere of those Gentiles to whom his apostleship was especially directed. You know, Paul, he's an apostle to the Gentiles. And so they were a large enough majority that Paul saw the church in Rome as coming within the orbit of his particular responsibility. Well, that raises a question. If that's in fact the case, if it is a predominantly Gentile church when Paul is writing to it in 57... How did it get that way, given the theory that it was founded by Jews who converted at Pentecost and went back to the synagogues? So it would have begun as a Jewish phenomenon. How is it now predominantly Gentile? Well, what looks like, or the best idea I think on that is, the Jews there would have converted to Christ. So you have Jewish Christians go back to the synagogues. And you had Gentiles or God-fearers who were always around the synagogue. They were the people who were very interested in Judaism, but they weren't willing to convert to Judaism. They weren't willing to be circumcised. They weren't willing to bite the whole bullet. But they were interested, and Paul had great effectiveness when he would go, and Gentiles would convert. So it looks like you have these Jews here who are converting Gentiles, converting these God-fearers, and then you had a shift in A.D. 49 where the balance, so you've got Jewish Christians, Gentiles are converting, I'm sure other Jews are converting. Well, what happens? In A.D. 49, Emperor Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome. He expels the Jews from Rome, and that would have had a dramatic impact on the balance. You see that uh, the Roman historian Suetonius, and he lived from 69 to 140. 
just to give you. So he's, he's right around the time. But this Roman historian Suetonius, he reports that Claudius expelled Jews from Rome because they were constantly rioting at the instigation of Crestus. Now, most scholars agree <clears throat> that Crestus is simply a misspelling or an alternate spelling of the Greek Christos. You see, that, that he says he, th these Jews, they're constantly rioting at the instigation of Crestus. Most scholars agree that's a reference to Christos, and that reference... Uh, so the reference is probably to disputes that you had in the Jewish community over claims that Jesus is the Christ. Well, you see that, right? That happens all over. So here you have turmoil in the Jewish community. Why? Because they're upset. This is causing tension. And when you got some Jews saying, no, he's not. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. What happens? All of this foment. All of these riots and concerns. Well, the emperor doesn't like that. I mean, he's an outsider looking. He says, look, they're constantly rioting at the instigation of Crestus, meaning they're rioting over this disagreement of whether Jesus is the Christ. And this expulsion, he then says, okay, Jews, out. Now, how many, you know, would he have gotten all of them? Away? Okay, you don't know. But we do know from Suetonius that he says, because they're riding at the instigation of Crestus, get out. And we have this recorded, in fact, the expulsion is referred to in Acts chapter 18, verse 2, where Priscilla and Aquila are expelled from Rome. Okay, what's that going to do to the, to the complexion or the composition of the church in Rome? Well, they're not going to distinguish between Jews and Jewish Christians. They're going to throw the Jews out. So what happens? Well, we've got a certain balance here in the church, and now when the Jews get expelled, now we're predominantly Gentile. Why? Because the Jews got the boot. And so they wound up going. So that's how I think you wind up with this. Now, as with similar expulsions, this sounds odd to us, but this isn't the only group that gets the boot throughout Roman history. I mean, this is how it is. Better that than get killed. <laughs> so, you know, but as with other groups that had been expelled... Specific groups, this expulsion didn't stay in force very long because Claudius, the one who'd issued it, he died in 54. The expulsion's in 49. He dies in 54. And then you have Jews like Priscilla and Aquila, they're able to return because you see that Priscilla and Aquila are back in Rome, in, Rome, in uh, chapter 16, verse 3. Acts 18, 2, they're not. They're in Corinth. They've got booted. Well, when he writes Romans, where are they? They're back. Okay, so you see how that works. So when Claudius dies, you have that the Jews can now return. So Jewish Christians who return, they would probably now be in a minority because they've been gone for a number of years while the church continued to grow. And so they come back and they're, they're a minority community and perhaps they were viewed with some condescension by the now dominant Gentile wing. Oh, that would never happen. Come on. Come on, people. Think about that. You see, so they come back and they're viewed as, you know, they don't get it. What do they know? And you can see this tension. And Paul addresses this tension in a number of places in Romans between the Jews and the Gentiles. Well, the general circumstances, so what's the purpose of the letter? What's Paul doing? Well, the general circumstances of the writing is that he's completed his pioneer work in these missionary work in these eastern provinces and now, after he delivers a collection, as I said, his plan is to go to Spain to preach. That's where Paul wants to go. He's heading to Spain to preach, and he hopes to visit Rome. And then he wants to continue on his way to Spain, having the church there in Rome as a, you know, going. He wants to go with their blessing. He wants to go with their interest in what he's doing. He wants to go with their support. So it's perfectly natural that he would write a letter to the church in Rome. Okay, one of the things that's puzzling, though, and is a matter of a long debate, is, is why he writes the particular things he writes. I mean, I could see him, you know, he's going to go to the, he, he wants to go there, he says, hey, I'm coming, and this kind of thing. Why does he write such a deeply theological letter. How is that related to his purpose in writing? Well, there are a number of reasons, I think, behind his writing of the letter. And as I say, you'd be, unless you play in this world and care about these kinds of things, you'd be surprised 
how much debate there is about, well, what's Paul's purpose in writing? Uh, why is he doing this? But it seems to me a number of things are, are relatively clear. The, the place and the relationship of Jews and Gentiles within Christianity was a hot issue among Christians outside of Rome. And there's, there's no reason to think that the Christians in Rome would have been isolated from that debate. I mean, this was a hot debate. How do these things fit together? What is the relationship of Jewish and Gentile Christians? How does this work out in practice? So that debate's going on outside, and so I suspect it's going on inside, and from what Paul says, I'm pretty certain that it's going on inside. Paul had battled Judaizers. He'd battled them in Galatia. You know, Judaizers who were saying, no, 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 that's fine. Jesus is fine. We're down with him. But if you want to be right with God, you must become a Jew. Yes, yes, Jesus, but it's Jesus through Judaism. Jesus has been added as our Messiah, so yes, you're saved, but you've got to become a Jew. You must be circumcised and you must obey the whole law of Moses if you want to be saved. So this comes up, and you see Paul battling people like that in Galatia. He battles people like that in Corinth. And he was concerned as, as he wrote Romans about how the gift of, that he's taking from the Gentile churches, you remember in 15, chapter 15, 25 to 31, He's concerned, how are they going to receive this gift? Because it wasn't simply a gift for the poor. It had tremendous theological significance. Here is a contribution from Gentile Christians coming to the poor Jewish Christians. What will they do with it? Will they say, oh, our brothers have given to us. Or will they say, Gentiles, dirty, not for us. Okay, Paul, he tells us he's concerned about that. How is this going? So I see this idea. So part of it, his reason for, for writing and, and what is on his mind there is that is this concern, you see this issue about Jews and Gentiles. Now, Paul also, he wanted to secure a missionary base for his work in, for his work in Spain. As every missionary, don't they always go around and say, hey, I want somebody with me, behind me, helping me, close contact. He had no email. He couldn't shoot over it, you know, longer trip. So to have somebody in Rome while he's going to Spain, that would be good. And so he wants to secure a missionary base for his work. So he wanted the, he wanted the Roman Christians to know the truth of the gospel that he preached. If you're going to join me and be with me, I want you to know the truth of the gospel that I preach and what it is. For some Jewish Christians, he needed to correct the false impression that his gospel was anti-law or maybe even anti-Jewish. You see that pop up in some Paul, right? So maybe you have people there saying, no, 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 Paul's got, so maybe he needed to correct a misunderstanding of his gospel on that point. And you can even see that, this idea of anti-law, you see it in Romans 3.8. Well, Paul's all for disgrace stuff, so he's lawless. So he needs to correct that. At the same time, he needed to change the thinking of those Jewish Christians who overemphasized the law and their Jewish prerogatives, those who wanted to hold on to the law and insist on it beyond its function in God's plan. So he had to deal with that and he had to address that and, and he had to change the thinking of those Gentiles who tended to scorn everything Jewish. And when you look in the last few chapters, you see Paul addressing these things. How are we to deal with one another? Where we have Jews who are concerned about consuming certain meat and this kind of stuff that they fear may have been processed in some way contrary to law. How are you to take that? And we'll get to that, Lord willing. You see, eventually we'll get to that, and I'll do my best to explain what's going on there. So I think what Paul is doing, he wants to unite Jew and Gentile around the truth of the gospel that they might, as one group, united, support his work in Spain, and he was no doubt aware that the church in Rome needed the kind of instruction that he was giving. 
So when we say, well, why is Paul writing this particular letter to you? Why does he say the kinds of things he's saying? Well, here are some of the outlines, but Paul is no doubt privy to things about that group that we don't know. You see, Paul knows what's going on. He knows what they need. And of course, the Spirit of God knows that the church throughout the ages has needed that. So he has Paul write that. And then you and I are blessed by it. Perhaps most importantly, as Colin Cruz points out in his commentary, Paul looks at this predominantly Gentile church in Rome as being, it's among those to whom his apostleship is especially directed. So Paul feels a responsibility toward them. They're part of his responsibility. So he writes the things he does because in his role as a minister among the Gentiles, he wants them, he says, to what? Be an acceptable offering to God. They're, they've come in his bailiwick. So Paul feels a responsibility before God. He wants them to be an acceptable offering to God, meaning he wants them grounded in the truth of the gospel. So that's why. Why is he developing all these things? He wants them to be grounded, to be right, to not be off base, to not tip to this side, not tip to that side, but to be firmly rooted and grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he wants them to have that so that they will be an acceptable offering to God. And in their specific context, that required Paul to address these particular matters about which he, he talks. So he knows, so he, he wants them to be acceptable. Well, what are the things I have to emphasize? What are the things I have to deal with? Paul says, okay, I'm going to lay it out. And so he does that, and I think that's what's behind what he's doing. That would also serve his purpose, of course, in securing a base for him to be, do his missionary work in Spain. Okay, so that's what I think is going on. Paul is writing the letter, 57. He's in Corinth. He's writing to the church in Rome. He's planning after he delivers the gifts to Jerusalem, he's going to go evangelize in Spain. And he knows about the Jewish and Gentile, predominantly Gentile church. He knows about things going on. And he then writes this letter to them. And you didn't think so, but we're actually going to get to the text. All right. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. <clears throat> Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, having been set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who came from the seed of David according to the flesh, who was appointed son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness from the resurrection of the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship for bringing about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, among whom you also are, those called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all the beloved of God who are in Rome, those called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I just think about being there when this, le this letter was read. Just sitting there and hearing this, this letter coming from Paul to this church in Rome. And here is this spiritual giant writing to, this, to these people. Well, Paul refers to himself as a slave, or you could translate it servant. But he refers to himself as a slave of Jesus Christ, who's been specially called by God to serve in the cause of God's gospel. Paul has been chosen. He's been picked out. He's been specially called. You know, he is on a mission from God. You remember the Blues Brothers? We're on a mission from God. He is on a mission from God. Paul has been called and signal, grabbed, singled out. I got a job for you. You're going to go and proclaim the great news of my gospel. He's there to proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus and the consequent amnesty and liberation that men and women may enjoy through faith in him. There is no message like it. There is no news like it. Now, I know our society, and societies vary. Our society, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. 
Because that carries responsibility to me to serve the God who has redeemed me. And I don't like that. I want to be God. I want to go. I want to have it all. I understand. But if we can be objective about it, there is no message like that. There is no message as wonderful as there is amnesty and liberation and freedom and life and joy through faith in Jesus Christ. That's some news to talk about. That's some news to announce. Well, this gospel which concerns uh, God's Son, Jesus Christ, it was promised in advance through the prophets in the Old Testament. It was promised in advance through the prophets in the Old Testament. These prophets, they include men like Moses. You can see, for example, in Acts 3, 21 to 23, Include men like David, Acts chapter 2, verse 30, as well as those that we classically understand as prophets. You see, it includes all of those people. In Romans 3.21, Paul insists that the law and the prophets testify to the righteousness made known through the gospel. The law and the prophets testify. The old books, it's there. They testify to it. And in, in Romans 16, 26, he says, the gospel had been made known through the prophetic scriptures. You see, there is continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament foreshadows. Now, can you go over here and find a page and read, oh yeah, Jesus is going to come? No. But it foreshadows the truth of the New Testament. The New Testament and this truth blooms out of this. And so Paul says, look, this was, this was told, it was foreshadowed, it was spoken of in the Old Testament through the prophets. Now there's a parallel structure in, in verses 3 and 4 that sometimes, uh, some translations you won't see it. But there is a parallel structure there that I've kind of set out this way. And you can see that in these verses... Many people think that Paul is quoting or he's drawing upon an early Christian creed. Now, a creed is simply a, a way of expressing beliefs. You see, we've had some, I, I know that we hate the word creed, we, we get nervous about it. But it's simply a way of stating in a short, so many people think, you see the, you see the form of it concerning his son, the doubt of Jesus Christ our Lord, who came from, according, who was, according, from. You see, when you see some structure like that, they think, well, that, that looks like something that was set up to basically summarize the gospel that Paul has referred to in verse 2. So many people think that, that this is, this is something here that, that you have. Paul referring or drawing on a known creed that circulated among Christians about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the point here, this, the preexistent Son of God... He came into existence through the lineage of David. You and I know all this. But we know it because we've read these things. You see, the pre-existent Son of God, He comes into human existence in the lineage of David. In Romans 15, 12, Paul applies to, G to Jesus Isaiah's statement, what? He will be the shoot of Jesse. Same idea. He'll be the shoot. I heard that bell. And in 2 Timothy 2.8, he again describes Jesus as what? From the seed of David. Well, what's the significance of that? Well, you know the significance of it, and I'll talk about it next week. Uh, this is messianic. See, this is messianic. This is Messiah talk. And so he's just confirming, indeed, he is the long-awaited Messiah, the descendant of David. Okay, thanks for coming.